Anatoly. Is the day spring? Worship the Lord this morning. Put your hands together if you are. And who wants to follow him more this morning? We're excited. We are excited. If you want more, hallelujah, then you want to do what we're doing this morning. Yeah, come on to the altar and worship with us. I'm chasing after you, no matter what. No matter what, no matter what I have to do, cause I need, cause I need you, more I do more and more, more and more, more and more. I need you more and more, more and more. I need you more and more. No matter what, no matter what I have to do, cause I need cause you, I need you, I need you more Jesus. and more. I'm chasing after I'm you, chasing after you. No matter what, no matter what I have, what I have to no do. matter what it takes, Lord, I need, I need you, need you more. Just to be closer. Just to be closer. I want to draw. 
draw closer, wanna draw closer, Lord. Chasing after I'm you. Chasing yeah. after you. Sing, I am chasing after I'm you. Chasing after you. I'm praising my way through. I'm praising your name. My praising my way through. I just wanna be closer just to, to be you. loves us and he gives us abundant mercy each and every day and we think that his promises aren't going to come but he's waiting on us he's waiting on us to hear him to be obedient to him and to just love him <laughs> everyone needs compassion the love that's never failing let mercy on me everyone needs forgiveness a kindness of the savior the hope of nations hope of nations savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty Find me all my fears and failures and fill my life again. I'll give you my light to follow everything I believe in. Jesus. 
Jesus conquered One more time, the grave. Savior. Savior, he can move a mountain. Any mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Hallelujah, church. If you have the joy of the Lord, come on, praise him like he deserves. Lift your voice, lift your hands. Let's praise him like he deserves. I don't know about you, but I got the joy of the Lord in my spirit. I have the joy of the Lord in my spirit. Come on, Chan. It's a simple song, but express your joy to the Lord this morning. Y'all can sing it with me. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. Come on, everybody sing. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. There's freedom though you've captured me. I've got joy. I've got joy. I've got joy instead of more. Come on, I don't think they gotta sing it again. There's beauty in my brokenness. There's beauty in my brokenness. Instead of pain, I got you love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. There's freedom though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. I've got joy instead of Come on now, here we go. Everybody say, You give me joy down deep in my soul. Come on, down deep in my down soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. You give me, you give me, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Sing it, folks. Sing it again. Beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love. I've got true love instead of pain. This freedom though you captured. This freedom though. I've got joy. Does anybody have joy? I've got joy instead of mourning. You bring me, you bring me. You bring me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep. down deep in my soul. If anybody's for joy, down come on, say. Down deep in my soul. You give me, you give me. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Come on, y'all know this. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never, never been more secure, knowing your heart. Come on, y'all say. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been so. Never been more secure, knowing your heart. Lord. Never been so free. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure. Never been more secure, knowing your heart. Now make it free. Never been so free. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart. I've never been so free. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure. Never been more secure. You bring me, you bring me, you bring me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul 
Sounds so good. Down Next time around, no music, Chad. No music. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. If you have soul. that joy, come on, express it in the word in your mouth. My soul. Speak to the Lord. Let him know you that you are happy. Joy. That he brings you down joy. Deep we thank you this soul. day for your blessing, down your deep mercy. In my Hallelujah. Soul. Down deep in my soul. Declare it. You bring me joy. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God is Alpha and Omega, that He is the beginning and He is the end. But the question is, do we make Him first in our life and do we let Him have the last say in our decisions? So today we want to give God glory. For those of you who are willing to say, in 2020, I'm going to put God first. He is not just going to be Alpha Omega on the pages of the Bible, but He is going to be Alpha. He is going to be first in my life because I'm going to yield that position to Him. And He is going to have the last say in every situation. Amen. You are Alpha and Omega. You, our Lord, you are worthy to be praised. If you believe that, sing that with me. You are Alpha. You are Alpha and Omega. And Omega. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, he is worthy. You are worthy to be praised. Every voice, let's sing that again. You are Alpha. You are Alpha. You are Alpha and Omega. And Omega. We We give you all the glory. Let's give God all the glory today. We give. We give you all the glory. We worship you. We worship you, our Lord. He's so worthy. You are nobody but you. We give you all, we give you all the glory. We give you all, we worship you all. So what does that mean? What does that look like in this moment? Are you giving God all the glory right now? Is this giving all the glory right now? We're going to sing that again. Give him all the glory now. We give. We give you all the This might be your last chance to do so. Don't hold back on God now because he's never hold back on you. Give him all the praise, all the glory. Bless his name in this moment. There is nobody like our God. He is the first, the uncreated God. He is the last. Give him all the glory. We give you. We give you all the glory. We worship you, God. We worship you alone, God. We worship you alone, God, because you are our Father. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are our healer. We give you all the glory. We rise up in this moment to worship you alone, God. We give you all the
let's just stay there in a moment of praise. Let's just stay here in a moment of praise. We are living in a world that is dark, and for many people who do not know the living Savior, they are afraid. And God is looking for those people who are willing to seek Him with their whole heart, who are willing to get out of themselves and praise God and to acknowledge Him as the one true and living God. Is that you? Are you the one who's willing to say, you are God and God alone, and I'm willing to put my pride aside and to worship you in this moment because you have done so much for me, because you have kept my life, because you have healed me. The best I can do is give you all the glory in this moment. I'm going to lift up my voice. I'm going to lift up my hands. I'm going to bow my heart into my knees and give you glory. We give you all. We give you all. Good morning, happy Easter. My name is Pastor Cliff. I'm the senior pastor of Dayspring Ministries in Middletown, Pennsylvania. I'm excited today to be able to come into your living rooms, into your dens, into your basements, into wherever you are, allowing me access into the holiness of your experience. Thank you for allowing me to speak a word to you today, a word of God that will be able to change your life and hopefully give you hope and encouragement through this very difficult time. As a matter of fact, the people who are virus experts have walked around, talked on different TV shows, telling everyone, testifying about how this is the worst week in the history of the virus, to prepare yourselves for the worst week. Well, the worst week 2,000 years ago was this Passion Week that Jesus went from Calvary, from Gethsemane to Calvary, and then to the tomb. But Jesus had experienced so many things in order to get the victory. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But when he left heaven to come to earth, he came with one purpose, and to pay for a debt that we couldn't pay for ourselves. There's no way in the world that we could have ever paid the debt of sin that Adam and Eve created and put on us back in the book of Genesis. The only way to eradicate the sin, the original sin, was for Jesus, the Son of God, to come to die on the cross at Calvary, to be raised again on that third day. And now he has paid the price for our sins. So we have the victory now. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 through 57. The scriptures that I'm going to point you to in the beginning of this message today, you usually hear at a funeral. And it usually goes over our heads because we're so gripped with emotion, loss, difficult emotional times and frustration that we have a difficulty really embracing this passage. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 through 57. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we live through this virus or not, if you are a professing Christian or a Christian, you need to understand the worst that it gets is that you get victory. You have victory either through this valley of the shadow of death or you end up not making it, which we hope you do. But we hope that you do it in a way that you'll act like Jesus has already paid the price. 
You know, there's a number of times I'll go to a restaurant and somebody out of my sight will pay the bill, pay the check. I'll go to Cracker Barrel or something and the waitress will come over and say, a, a gentleman paid for your breakfast, a gentleman paid for your lunch. Now, I didn't ask them to do that, but still my lunch was paid. I don't try to get the waitress to let me pay again. I don't try to find the person that did it because had the person wanted to be known, they would have told me. But they did that anonymously. Jesus didn't do it that way. As a matter of fact, when Jesus walked in and did this scripture here, when he won and got the victory, he took a victory lap. And I want to talk to you today about the victory lap that Jesus took. You know, when you go to a track meet, you have people that are running. And then after they get done running, the winner will usually take a victory lap where they move around the track slower than they ran their race, but so that the crowd can clap and get excited about and honor the person for the work that they put in and the victory that they received. But what they don't pay attention to are all that went into that victory. Jesus came, born in a manger, suffered under Pilate. Jesus put in his work. Over the years, how many times did he tell his disciples, how long must I suffer with you? Jesus was in trouble the whole three and a half years of his public ministry. But that went into this victory. Everything that he did, every word that he spoke, every miracle that he performed, every sign that he showed, every person that he helped, every difficulty and training that he put in, all paid dividends and moved him towards this final leg of his race. His race began back in heaven and then it came to earth in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son. The stuff was already in action. And then what Jesus did over this period of time, three and a half years, he was not only learning, growing and developing, but he was helping other people to face the difficulties in their life just like he did. He says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's teaching his disciples, but teaching disciples how to live is one thing. They had trouble even experiencing life. So this thing called death, you knew they were going to have some difficulty experiencing death. But Jesus set this whole thing up so that they would learn that death is just another step in eternal life. You got to die to go to heaven. So when Jesus did what he did here about death and, and sin and victory, when Jesus got up out of the tomb, he took a victory lap. Jesus was buried and raised on the third day, according to scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last he appeared to me, Paul, as one born abnormally. Paul was a man who wrote this book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians. And he's letting us know that Jesus, when he died and he rose again, there was some work that he needed to do because most people believed that when he died, he was going to stay dead. And he wanted to let people know, yes, you killed me. Yes, I went into the tomb, but I'm no longer in the tomb. And what I want to do now is prove to all of you over the next 40 days that I rose from the dead. And here's what Jesus did when he came out of the tomb. The first thing he did was he reminded everybody that he predicted his death and his resurrection. He told his disciples, he told everybody that when I died the three days after that, I am going to raise from the dead. He predicted it. He told them, he said the Bible records that Jesus began to show his disciples that he has to go to Jerusalem and there he's going to suffer and die. 
Can you imagine being under that pressure of knowing that you're going to die, how you're going to die, when you're going to die, where you're going to die, and he still has to take out time to teach us how to live? So with this ticking clock of him moving towards his end, he never stopped teaching, but he always told everybody that I must suffer and I must die. And there's a reason for that, because in order to get the victory, I've got to run the race that has been charted out for me. So here we have Jesus acknowledging the fact that the people that they hold in high regard, the elders and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief priests, those are going to be the ones that are going to kill him. But he predicted that, but the disciples didn't get it. Do you know how much of the Bible we as Christians don't get? As a matter of fact, not only do we not get it, we don't want to get it. We hear the scripture about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but we never take into consideration how we're going to be absent from the body. But then we turn on the news now and we find a hundred and some people have died over the last three hours. And, and then now we're getting a grip on death is a reality that other people around the world are dying. But the real question is, have they died in victory? And what Jesus is trying to remind us of that he predicted this resurrection. Now, I believe that the reason he wanted to do this was because if you believe him prior to his death and resurrection, that he already knew about it and prepared for it, then you'll take scriptures like this to heart. I go to prepare a place for you. If it weren't so, I wouldn't tell you. He says, I'm already way out front on the fact that you're going to have to leave this place. And if you leave it right, meaning if you give your life to me, then I'm going to go ahead and make sure that you have a place to stay in glory. To be absent from the body is to be present with me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. So Jesus made mention of the fact that that's what he's going to do, but also you can take him at his word if he knew in advance that he was going to suffer and die and raise again on the third day and it came to pass. Why would you doubt him going to prepare a place for you? The second thing Jesus did, he made numerous appearances. He came out of his tomb and just outside of the tomb on that Sunday morning, he met these women and he began to minister to them. Told them who he was what he had done, where he, and go tell my disciples, the ones who don't believe that there is resurrection, the, the ones I spent three and a half years with pouring myself into, go tell the men that I spent time with feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000, walking on water, healing a man by the name of Legion. I mean, they saw it all, but they still when the time came, didn't have enough faith or courage to show up at the tomb. Jesus predicted all through his ministry with his disciples. He told them in the beginning, I must suffer and die. They like, no, Lord, you won't have to suffer and die. Jesus said, I've got to. If, if I don't die, then you can't be delivered. You can't have victory unless my victory looks like defeat. As I'm hanging on the cross of Calvary, everybody thinks I lost when really what I was doing was paying the penalty, the price for your salvation, for your deliverance, for your future, for your eternity. So he told these ladies, he said, look, now I want you to understand. It's me. You've seen me before. I've ministered to you. They were so excited to see Jesus because they thought somebody stole him. But when they talked to this man that they thought was the gardener, Jesus assured them that who he was and they began to feel encouraged. That's one thing about Christianity. When you can see Jesus in the middle of whatever you're going through, a peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. It's amazing how when God shows up that you have a greater peace and a greater feeling of comfort. So these ladies were comforted, ran back and told the disciples. The disciples came and ran, but Jesus wasn't there. 
He told them, tell those guys to meet me in Galilee. But then later that day, Jesus got on the road to Emmaus and met two men who were leaving Jerusalem. He wanted to show himself to the people as he took his victory lap. He showed himself to the women. He showed himself to these men on the road to Emmaus. And scripture shows that he showed himself to his disciples and then to more than 500 people. He was taking his victory lap. He wanted everybody to know that he got up, that he won the race, that he finished his course. He wanted the disciples to know that they can move forward in power. One of the greatest things that I think Jesus does for we as Christians is as you give your life to Christ and you grow and develop through your reading of the scriptures, through your discipleship, by spending time with other Christians, by praying and meditating in the word, you'll find that a change comes over you. And one of the last victories that you will ever get, one of the victories that you'll receive from Jesus is the victory of courage. Now, these disciples were afraid to come out. Peter denied Christ three times on the night they took him out of fear. Then the disciples are huddled up in a home on the morning that Jesus said he was going to get up. Fear gripped them. But then over the next 40 days as he was taking his victory lap before the ascension, these disciples got a clue because they have been empowered with the Holy Spirit. What they had with Christ and before Christ wasn't powerful enough for them to get courage and faith and go forward fearless. But after Jesus died, after Jesus rose on the third day, after Jesus took his victory lap and spent time with all of the people that wanted a piece of him, it was after the Spirit of God had indwelled within them that we find that these scaredy cats, these, these cowards, all of a sudden began to become fearless because of the victory that Christ achieved. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, here's what it says. It says, wait a minute now. These men that we have arrested, there's something about these men. They're speaking boldly and with courage. As a matter of fact, I can tell that these are ordinary men, but I can tell that they had been with Jesus. I wonder, have you yet decided to live a victorious life in Christ? This whole thing, it, it, you already have received the victory because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. His resurrection is what gives us the victory. But now we need to act like it. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw these ordinary men and saw that there were some things that they were doing that was different from an ordinary person. You know, you can go from church to church and find ordinary Christians. But when you have Jesus in your life and you know that you have the victory in Christ, you will become extraordinary. This Easter Sunday. You ought to commit yourself to becoming extraordinary because of the victory that Jesus has won for us. We need to just learn how to act like it because we already have the victory. Beloved, I want to just encourage you today on this Easter Sunday to spend some time with your family sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The things that you have in your life were given to you by him. The things that you have in your life, he died and suffered so that you might have them. Jesus is the one that prepared all of what you have for you. Because naked you came into the world and naked you're going to leave. But while you're here on earth, I want to encourage you, walk in victory. Don't walk around here talking about what might happen. Can you imagine if Jesus, instead of the last seven words, got up and complained? Complained about, why are you doing this to me after all I've done for you? Wasn't appreciated. He didn't do that. 
What he did was he took time to go ahead and let everybody know that you're still the object of my concern. On this Easter Sunday morning, you are still the object of God's concern. He loves you. You say, well, now where is Jesus? If you're a born again believer, he's in your heart. He's in your life. The Holy Spirit leads you, guides you, directs you, challenges you, comforts you. And that was the gift that Jesus left us when he went away. So, yes, he left, but he left something behind. He left victory in our hearts. He left power in our hearts. He left good decisions in our hearts. What he did, he said, we will do. He even said, greater things will you do than I have done. So, beloved, today on this Easter Sunday, I want you to take a victory lap in your home, in your uh, living room, in your den. Just walk around your house in victory. Lead the way. Show your children that you have victory over everything. Everything. Because he has won the victory for you. And I mean, it would be an exercise, but just march around the house, single file, Indian style, showing them that you have the victory. And yes, we may appear to be ordinary, but because of what Jesus did by getting up out of that tomb, we have become extraordinary. And from this day forward, I'm going to live up to what Jesus had paid for. There's no way in this creation that we ought to walk away from Easter Sunday with anything other than power to achieve. No matter what it is you're facing, some of you are wondering, will you still have the same job that you had before the pandemic? Will you still have the resources and will you still have this? And that's, a, that's a defeated life. The bottom line is that when you started this trip, you had nothing. Now you got something and you're afraid to lose the little something that you had. In closing, years ago, there was a difficulty here in the church that I thought reflected pretty poorly on me. There were some leaders that actually tried to split the church. And as a result of that, I took that as me being not the kind of leader that I need to be. So I went to the Lord and I asked him, I said, Lord, should I resign? the church. And he turned to me and he said, Cliff, you had more faith in me starting the church than you do in me keeping the church. The bottom line of this whole thing is that God, my deliverer, gave me the strength and the determination and the, and, and the courage to start this church but now I'm doubting him along the way because of something negative that happened. You can be victorious today in whatever it is that God has done in your life. Be victorious. Face it with power. Face it with victory. You already have the victory. Act like it. So as we go forward, I look forward to seeing all of you soon. God bless you. I'd like to encourage everyone watching this video to join us again next week, next Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. so that you'll hear another word from the Lord so that we can move forward, trusting and believing with our whole heart what God is doing, what he can do and will do for us. All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Sometimes we need a divine reminder about how good God is and how he manages the damage. Let's come together next Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. so that we can study the Word of God, hear the Word of God, and move from the Word of God to being a person who practices what they learn. More than a hearer of the Word, we want to become doers. See you next week.